This is Jim Sanders. I, I just want to check as we go. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was afraid when I went out and came back in, I would have had the same um, uh, audio problems, but it sounds like it may have, Cindy has corrected it. Thank you. Cindy, do we have everybody? Not quite. Cindy, I'm here. Um, I don't know if you saw me. I did not see you. <laughs> yeah. was, was it you I was chatting with, Scott? Um, <laughs> I got a question <laughs> that said Soroka, question yeah. mark. And so is that you? Yes. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you to a panelist. It just says Scott, so I wasn't sure which oh, Scott okay. that might be. You should have never gotten that haircut, Soroka. <laughs> I know. I'm incognito now. I'm sorry, Councilman Soroka. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> I'm jealous of your haircut, man. Trust me. I'm like shaggy here. I think we are all here now, Mayor. Okay. And you've got Scott where he needs to be. He is where he needs to be. Okay. <laughs> We'll uh, go ahead and get started then. We'll call the Johnson City Council meeting number 21-02 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Council member Cope? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Soroka? Here. We have a quorum. Cindy, do we have anyone with us this evening that is not uh, councilman or council councilor staff? We have 19 people. Um, attending. I don't know all for what. I know some are for Matt, some are for Clayton. I know Janet has someone. So hopefully we will figure that out while you're doing your introduction, public hearing kind of things here. Let so. me, uh, let me, before I proceed any further, first, uh, I've skipped over the COVID-19 information statement. So let me, uh, let me read that real quickly. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with Governor Reynolds' March 19, 2020 proclamation suspending the regulatory provisions of Bio Code Section 21.8 or any other statute imposing a requirement to hold a public meeting or hearing, the City of Johnson will conduct meetings electronically with the public allowed to attend per instructions denoted on the meeting's particular agenda. Meeting minutes will continue to be posted per the City's normal course of business. Okay, moving down to the welcome, uh, I would like to welcome everyone that is with us this evening. Um, if you are here for an item that is on the agenda, we would ask for you to wait for that item to come up and uh, indicate at that time that you would like to speak. Um, actually, if you could indicate previous to that, uh, the item that you would like to speak on, that would be helpful to Cindy. Um, if you're here for an item that is not on the agenda, there will be an opportunity under public communications to speak. Again, in either case, if you want to speak this evening, please uh, uh, enter into the chat box um, who you are. Um, address would be great to provide at that time, as well as the item that you want would that you want to speak on, and that will help uh, Cindy as we move through the agenda to uh, let you in and and. Uh, uh, allow you to make your comments at that time. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, the agenda approval. Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? Yes, Mayor, we do have one change to the agenda. It relates to item 8A, which is third consideration of um, uh, adoption of ordinance 1046 related to a, a subject property at uh, uh, 11087. Um, Towner Drive. 
This, um, at the request of the developer, they've asked that that item be tabled this evening. So we won't plan on taking action on it, but we will put it on the table to a, a date uncertain. There's some pending items that the um, uh, developer needs to work on. So uh, we will still bring it up at the time uh, on the agenda, but the action that's requested would be to uh, table that item. Okay. Are there any other changes? No. Council, do you have any changes? No. If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move, Suresh. Second, Cope. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Motion pass. Moving on to public communications. We have one public communication this evening, and that is uh, the 2020 Community Survey Findings Report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We have tonight, we have Jason uh, Morado with ETC Institute. He is going to go over the community survey results. Um, we had gathered um, responses from residents in November and part of December. So I will turn it over to Jason to go over these exciting results. I think this um, says a lot about our community and how we're moving ahead. So Jason, I'll let you take it over. Great, thanks, Janet. Let me see if I can share my screen here. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yep. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, my name is Jason Morado. I'm with ETC Institute. And ETC is a marketing research firm based in Olathe, Kansas, which is in the Kansas City area. And the thing we specialize in is conducting community surveys for local governments. And this past November and December, for the fourth time, we conducted a community survey for the city of Johnston. If you've seen the full report, it's very detailed and comprehensive. So today what I'm gonna do is go through the high level key findings from the survey. I do have one slide about ETC Institute. We're based in the Kansas City area, but we're a national leader in providing market research for local governments. We've been doing this type of work for over 35 years. And in the last 10 years alone, we've conducted surveys in more than 900 communities in 49 states. So this is really the type of work that we specialize in. <clears throat> this is just a quick rundown of what I'll go through today. I'll go over the purpose and methodology of the survey. What I call the bottom line up front is our main conclusions from the survey. And then I'll go through the major survey findings to show how we came to those conclusions. And I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. So there's several reasons to conduct a survey like this. One is to get an objective assessment of how satisfied residents are with major city services. And then also to help determine what residents feel are the top priorities for the community. With this survey, we're also able to measure trends from the previous surveys. Uh, I mentioned this is the fourth time we've conducted a community survey for the city of Johnston. A lot of the questions remain the same each time so that we can track the trends, but then we do make a few tweaks to the survey each time as well. And then also we're able to compare your results with other communities across the country. <clears throat> so this survey was seven pages long. That's a, a pretty typical length for a community survey. Um, usually there's six to seven pages, maybe a little bit on the high end. I mentioned that this survey included a lot of the same questions that we asked on previous years. The one addition this year is that we had several COVID related questions that we added to the survey. The survey was administered by a combination of mail and online to randomly selected residents throughout the city. Our goal is to get at least 400 completed surveys and we accomplished that. We ended up with 408. And one thing we always do when we're administering these surveys is as we're collecting the data, we check the demographics of survey respondents to make sure it reflects the actual population of the city. So we make sure we have a good representation by key demographic areas, such as age, race, ethnicity, and gender. And the results of the 408 surveys at the 95% level of confidence has a margin of error plus or minus 4.8%. So essentially that means that if we conducted this survey the same way 100 times, 
95 times the results would be plus or minus 4.8% from what we're reporting. So the results aren't perfect, but really it's a very small margin of error. Here we have a map of the city. The red dots are households that completed the survey. So we had a good distribution throughout the city. And this looks similar to what we've had in previous years. So here are our main conclusions from the survey, um, broken down to one PowerPoint slide. We found that residents have a very positive perception of the city. 87% of respondents were satisfied with the overall quality of life in the city of Johnston and 86% are satisfied with the overall quality of services that are being provided by the city. We also found that overall, the satisfaction ratings this year are similar to the previous year we conducted the survey, in, which was in 2018. And that's a good thing because the results were really outstanding in 2018. Um, they're really outstanding again overall. And just like previous years, the satisfaction with city services is much higher in Johnston than it is in other communities. In fact, you rate it higher than the US average in 41 out of 43 areas. And in most cases, significantly higher, not just two or three or 4%, but many cases, 15, 20, even 25% above uh, the, uh, the national average. And we'll look at that in, in some more detail in a little bit. There's a couple of areas I especially wanted to point out when you look at the overall quality of city services, Johnston rated 38% above the US average. And that's one of the most important questions on the survey because they were asking residents to take into account all the different services that we're providing and really giving kind of an overall satisfaction rating for the city. <clears throat> Another area that really stands out is the overall quality of customer service. Um, there you rated 36% above the US average. And then we found the top overall priorities are traffic flow, recreation programs and facilities, and the city street system. So first we'll look at some general perceptions that residents have of the city. Here we asked residents to rate their perceptions in a number of different ways. So the dark blue are residents who are very satisfied, the light blue is satisfied, the gray is neutral, <clears throat> And we interpret neutral as meeting expectations. So rating of a three on the five point scale. And then the pink and red are those who are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. So overall, the positive ratings far away the negative. Um, you look at this top row, almost 95% of residents feel safe in the city of Johnson. I mentioned earlier that 87% are satisfied with the overall quality of life. And if you look at this third row, 86% are satisfied with the overall quality of city services. And that's compared to only 2% who are dissatisfied, which is a, a really amazing, amazing ratio of uh, positive to, to negative responses. Here we ask residents to rate major categories of city services. So here we're asking residents to rate these areas at the big picture departmental level. And then later on in the survey, we asked about some more specific areas within some of these categories. So one of the things that really stands out here is how few people were dissatisfied with any of these services. Um, across the board, the satisfaction ratings were high and there were very, very few dissatisfied residents. In fact, for every single area, 15% or less of residents were dissatisfied. In a lot of cases, it's less than 10%. And there's even some areas where less than 5% of residents were dissatisfied. If you look at the top of this chart, the highest rated areas are fire and EMS, police services, and parks. <clears throat> so here we have a map of the city. And what we did here is we broke the results out by census block group. So these are very, very small areas. <clears throat> and what this does is it tells us if residents in different parts of the city are rating services differently. We create a map like this for every question asked on a five point scale. So the report has about 70 to 80 maps. Uh, like this. This one is for the overall quality of city services, and you can see the entire map is blue. In fact, you've got a few areas in dark blue, which is the highest possible rating. So that tells us that residents in all parts of the city are satisfied with the overall quality of city services. Sometimes what happens is, even if the results are really positive overall, once you start breaking it into these smaller groups, you see some pockets where some residents might be dissatisfied. Um, but when you look at the overall quality of services, uh, positive ratings all throughout the city. 
So I mentioned earlier that satisfaction with city services is much higher in Johnson than it is in other communities. For these next few charts, <clears throat> the orangish line are Johnson residents who are either very satisfied or satisfied. The light blue are the satisfaction ratings from residents throughout the Midwest. And the dark blue are the ratings for residents from all across the US. This first charts for perceptions of the city. And you can see in all six areas, you rate significantly higher than other communities. There's two areas I especially wanna point out. This third row down, which is the overall quality of city services, which again is one of the most important questions on the survey. You have an 86% satisfaction rating and the regional and national average is only around 50%. And then if you look at this bottom row, <clears throat> this is another one of the most important questions on the survey. Value residents receive for city tax dollars and fees. You have a 59% satisfaction rating, which that might seem low compared to some of the other numbers that, that you have on different areas. But you can see that the regional and national average is only around 40%. So for this question, 59% is a really, really outstanding number. Here are comparisons for major categories of city services. You can see in most areas, you rate significantly above other communities, which is what the, the dark uh, blue arrow indicates. The area I especially wanna point out here is this fifth one down, overall customer service from city employees. You have a 78% satisfaction rating. The regional average is only 49%, national average only 42%. So really, really outstanding uh, customer service numbers. For public safety, in just about all these areas, again, you rate significantly higher than other communities. If you look at these top three rows, overall quality of fire protection, overall quality of police protection, overall quality of emergency medical services, for each one, your satisfaction rating is 90% or higher. For parks and recreation services, um, very high ratings for parks, walking and biking trails, the only areas on the survey where you rated below both the regional and national average were recreation programs for adults and for youth. And then for maintenance, here we have 11 different areas that we compared to other communities. And for every single one, you rated significantly higher than both the regional and national average. And this includes a wide variety of different areas, uh, curbside trash collection, recycling, overall cleanliness of streets, um, maintaining streets, sidewalks, street lighting, just across the board, really, really high satisfaction ratings. And then for communication, um, you also rate it much higher than other communities when it comes to the availability of information about programs and services, and then the level of public involvement and decision making. For the website, it's, it's still a little more on par with other communities. So we also took a look at the trends and overall the satisfaction ratings are similar to what they were in 2018, which again is a, is a very good sign because the results were excellent in 2018. I pointed out here some of the areas that had the biggest increases and decreases in satisfaction uh, since 2018. So some of the biggest increases were related to the overall quality of stormwater drainage, uh, maintaining city park restrooms and shelters, street lighting, the quality of residential development, the level of public involvement in local decision-making, and then how well the city's planning for growth. The biggest decreases, a lot of them were related to recreation programs, uh, senior recreation programs, uh, youth and adult programs, um, library programs, which that's, you know, in a lot of communities across the country, ratings are down for libraries just because of the, the limited hours due to COVID restrictions. Um, and then maintaining buildings and facilities. These are the trends for that question that shows the major categories of city services. So the brown line are the 2020 satisfaction ratings, light blue are the ratings for 2018, and then the dark blue are the ratings for 2013, which is the, the first year we conducted the survey. So the ratings have remained uh, just amazingly consistently high year after year. Uh, this year, there was a decrease of a 5% or more in city buildings and facilities and then recreation programs. But then there were significant increases in stormwater drainage system and then overall quality of the city street system. 
So we also took a look at some priorities to focus on. So this is what we call the important satisfaction rating. And the idea behind this is that um, the areas that have a combination of a low satisfaction rating, but also rated as the most important should be the highest priorities. So there's really two types of data that factor in here, uh, satisfaction rating, and then the areas that residents feel are the most important for the city to emphasize over the next couple of years. So this is for major categories of city services. Uh, the top priority is traffic, overall traffic flow. Second is recreation programs. And third is the city street system. Now, one thing you'll notice is these all fall into the medium priority category. The reason there's nothing in a high priority category is because the satisfaction ratings are very high overall. Um, if the satisfaction ratings were lower, some of these areas would probably be flagged as a very high or high priority. All right. And then we have one more important satisfaction rating table. This one specifically on maintenance. Here, the top two priorities are maintaining sidewalks and maintaining city streets. So we've got a few other findings to take a look at. This was a question we asked for the first time this year. We asked, what are your primary sources of information about COVID-19? So the top source was the local news. Almost 80% of respondents get information about COVID-19 from the local news. 75% um, get information from national news. This is a question we've asked on some other surveys recently. And these are always the top two sources of information about COVID-19. But usually national news is one and local news is second. Um, this is one of the only times I can remember local news being the number one source of information. Um, so obviously the city's doing a great job providing information to residents about COVID-19 issues. Here we asked, do you feel that roundabouts are accomplishing the goal of improving safety? Um, so this survey in 2018, right? In 2018, 49% of residents felt like the roundabouts were accomplishing their goal. This year that number is up to 59%. So a significant increase of residents who gave positive ratings to uh, roundabouts improving safety. We also asked about sources of information um, related to all kinds of city issues, just general city information. The top sources of information are Johnson Living Magazine, city's website, and utility bill. We asked, should the city place emphasis on bringing retail to the city? 75% said yes. Uh, that's compared to 22% who said no, and 3% uh, were not sure. And these results are similar to what we had on the survey last time. Then we asked, should the city put an emphasis on bringing restaurants to the city? 84% said yes, 12% uh, no, 4% not sure. And this is also very similar to the results we had in 2008. We asked what types of retail and restaurant options you'd like to see in Johnston. Um, almost 80% said casual dining or just a little over 80%. 60% said specialty shops, 46% shops, uh, fine dining. And then we asked, what is the one primary reason that you've chosen to live in Johnston? So the top choice was the school system that was selected by 26% of respondents. The other top reasons were the great quality of life and living close to work. Jason, can I ask you a quick question on that last question? Yeah, absolutely. So is that, a, is that a question we've asked previously as well? Do we have any trend data on that question? You know, I, I don't think we asked it. We ought to double check um, if we did or not. I think we might have at least tweaked the wording a little bit. Um, but if we did ask it before, I, I will definitely check the, the compare the results. Um, yeah, I, I will check on that and get back with you. All right, thanks. So really, that's everything that I had. Um, just a quick recap. We saw that residents have a very positive perception of the city, uh, very high ratings for the overall quality of life and the overall quality of city services. Overall, the satisfaction ratings are similar to 2018, which is a very good sign. Once again, you rate it much higher than other communities in most areas, with two of the ones that really stand out being overall quality of city services and then customer service. 
And then the top overall priorities um, were traffic flow, recreation programs and facilities, and then the city street system. So that's everything that I had. Uh, once again, really, really outstanding results. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Jason, this is this is Mayor Derenfeld. I don't have any questions. I just have a comment, and I I just I just want to say thank you to you as well as to ETC for all of your good work on this. Um, you know, it's um, it's great to see results like this, and I think we can all be proud of of the uh, kind of feedback that we've gotten uh, from our community on all of the services um, and the programs that we provide to them. You know, I think that uh, even though we can feel good about it, uh, we don't want to we don't want to rest on our laurels. We know we have some work to do, um, but I don't think that you know any of the areas that they identified as areas that we need to work on are surprises to us. Um, I think in those areas where they've given us very high scores, you know, our plan is to continue to make sure that that our residents are uh, very satisfied. Um, but even in those areas where we know that we've got some work to do, we've already got plans to address those 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 areas. So, um, you know, I think that uh, we'll continue to uh, push forward and, and and do great work. And and uh, I think that you know this uh, this affirms that we're headed in the right direction in many many areas. And uh, uh, that uh, you know that um, it it provides additional information to to uh, in, you know, inform decisions that we make in the future. So this is, this is great. This is great stuff. Uh, thanks, thanks for working with us to, to, uh, to come up with uh, the, these results. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do wanna point out one thing, the question about, I'm gonna go back to this question on the survey. The question as to whether we'd asked this question before, um, we did ask it in 2018 and the results were very similar that year. Um, that year, school system was a top choice. It was 24%. Quality of life was second also, it was 16%. And living close to work was also third, and it was 14%. So very, very, very similar results here a couple of years ago. Council, have any comments or questions? I just had a quick question on the, on, if you go back to the chart that you had up, your PowerPoint, that had sort of the priority areas um, and it, you had like the three red arrows. Right. You know, that one right there. Yeah. So so the the kind of the one, two and three, but it, the thing that was kind of interesting to me is that the satisfaction percentage for those three are all above 60%. So it's not like those are areas that people have a high level of dissatisfaction with. And is that, is that kind of unique that you would from other studies where you've done polling in, um, where you've seen that that even the ones that they've identified as priorities have that, that high a satisfaction level or any thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a great observation. Um, and that's exactly right. Those, those were the highest priorities from this list because their satisfaction was the lowest among this group, but the lowest still means, like you say, over 60%, uh, which is outstanding. I mean, there's, there are definitely times where satisfaction ratings are in the 30s or 40% range or even lower. Um, and you see here where it says medium priority, a lot of times there'll be an area that's high priority or even very high priority. And that'd be for items that have a lower satisfaction rating. Um, so these three are the highest among this list, but that definitely there's no major reason for concerns. You know, they're all still, still all still have excellent ratings. <clears throat> Other, com other comments or questions? Well, again, uh, Jason, thank you for being with us this evening and, and thanks to you and ETC for your great work. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Okay, Cindy, can you pull up the agenda for me? I think the next, I don't think we have any other scheduled public community, public communications. So we'll, uh, do we have anyone who wants to speak to us under public communication, Cindy? On an item that is not otherwise on the agenda? Not that anyone has indicated. Okay. 
We'll move on to public hearings then. We have two public hearings this evening. The first is to conduct a public hearing and consider first reading of ordinance number 1047, amending the Birchwood Crossing PUD to allow the display, sales, and maintenance of all electric vehicles, AEVs, and to allow IC Industrial Commerce Park District uses and outdoor storage within parcel B of said PUD. Subject property is located north of Birchwood Court at 7801 and 7901 Birchwood. And we will open this public hearing at 7.33. Okay, this is Aaron Wolf with the Community Development Department. Uh, Cindy, if you could please open that staff report uh, PDF. And there is a um, vicinity map in there that will help to aid this discussion. Just my aerial map. There we go. The uh, area should be in the blue cross hatch there. So the owners of property at 7801 and 7901 Birchwood Court, they requested an amendment to the Birchwood Crossing PUD. Um, the amendment would allow for the display, sales, and service of all electric vehicles. And it would also allow IC Industrial Commerce Park District uses as well as outdoor storage. Um, both of these properties are located in parcel B of the PUD, and parcel B is um, what's shown there in the blue crosshatch. Um, what is not shown, that's not a current aerial, um, there was a site plan that was approved um, a year ago, two years ago, and um, what you see in blue crosshatch is actually two lots, and the westernmost lot has been developed. There is a, uh, a warehouse building that's been constructed on that lot, and it, it sits there today. Um, that westernmost lot would be 7901, and the, and the one to the right of it is 7801. Um, the Planning Commission, they did consider these proposed amendments at their last meeting, and they voted to recommend approval, um, but they did ask to impose a condition that the, any outdoor storage that is conducted on the lots um, be allowed behind the structures only. So they didn't want to see outdoor storage between the uh, front of the building and, and the interstate. Um, so, so any, any outdoor storage would be behind the building. Um, of course, there's language typical to outdoor storage that I included in the PUD amendment. Um, for instance, it can't exceed more than 30% of the total lot area. Um, it has to be screened from view from public streets and adjacent properties. And um, I, we've been inserting um, additional language in um, lately that would require any outdoor storage um, not to exceed the height of the screening fence. Um, we, you know, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of requiring a screening fence if they um, conduct storage that then exceeds the height of that fence. So I've, I've inserted that language in there as well. Um, let's see, this tonight is the public hearing and first reading of the ordinance. Um, I did send notice to adjacent property owners. We did have one um, a resident who attended the planning commission meeting and, and had some concerns about um, semi-traffic on Birchwood Court. Um, and I believe that person did ask me um, how to attend tonight's meeting. So I'm assuming they're in the audience with us tonight. So when we, we uh, get to that point, um, let's make sure that we ask if there's anybody who, any public in attendance. Does anybody have any questions for me about this uh, proposed PUD amendment? Also, have any questions for Aaron? Aaron, can you show this is Councilman Cope? Can you? I, I'm trying to I'm looking at. I think there's a document kind of. Um, it's um, it's Are you part of your site plan. Yeah, that shows kind of the outdoor storage area. Yeah, in in my uh, staff report, there's a page. It's not this one, Cindy. I'm sorry. It's above this, um, maybe third or fourth page in my staff report, right there. Um, this is the uh, building that sits on 7901 Birchwood Court today. Um, again, it's existing. Um, all, all, everything that you see there is on the site today. Um, the building, all of that parking, and I don't have control of the mouse, but behind the building you can see a darker square. Cindy, yep, right there. And that is where they're proposing to conduct the um, outdoor storage on the lot. And Aaron, can you describe the nature of the outdoor storage? What, what will be stored there? 
I'm hoping that we have a representative from uh, Hubble here with us tonight, but my understanding is um, they have a tenant uh, who's inter who, who does um, 5G um, installations. And so what they would be storing out there is, is equipment that's pertinent to um, installation of, of um, internet service equipment. Um, but it, uh, let's maybe turn to the audience and see if we do have a representative from Hubble who could maybe expand on that. I think Chris Trosper. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. So, Aaron, you've described this correctly. This is for a, a more technical based tenant that would do 5G network installations. I mean, the nature of this business is that when they do upgrades to these networks around the state, some of that equipment then is owned by various telecom companies, whether it be uh, Sprint, Verizon, you know, a variety of different uh, uh, businesses. They need to a temporary place to store some of that equipment while it's picked up by those vendors, as I understand it. So uh, it's equipment that's not owned by the tenant, but ultimately is picked up uh, when those systems are upgraded uh, across the state. So could you describe to us what the, um, uh, what, what the barrier, what barricade is going to look like? Uh, we tried to show a photo to PNZ of an existing location that this tenant uses. Um, essentially in, in the history of what they've done kind of in other areas of the country, it's a, you know, it's a normal kind of six foot tall fence with kind of the, the fabric screening around it to make sure that, you know, it just isn't necessarily unsightly. Uh, and obviously as Aaron's pointed out here, this is Kind of the centerpiece behind the center of the building so um you know difficult to see from birch birchwood court to begin with and we were trying to be sensitive to that and, and agreed with what pnz was uh, suggesting we would not have wanted this as a landlord on the side or in the front of the building we were intentionally trying to keep this isolated so I, I guess what I'm thinking is it's not intended to be permanent. If this tenant were to move someplace else, this this structure would come down. Correct. We would, you know, it was not our intention to try and come at this and say, hey, we were looking for outdoor storage. Correct. Mm -hmm. Council, have any other questions? And this this building that's dis, that's depicted here the the main building there's the intent is to build another building to the east of that as well right there is and so a that go ahead correct yeah there is a sister building that has gone through site plan um you know early early uh, approvals and and there is a, a sister building that could be built to the east correct and so that would kind of act as as a screen as well of the outdoor storage to to whether it be birchwood crossing or um, um, the, um, the interstate too. Correct. Other questions, council? This is a public hearing. I do believe that we have someone who has indicated would like to address the council on this item. Um, Roxanne Huzz. Use? Hoose. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I just bought my house down on Carter Court. So um, I have a few questions on the um, art with this because I used to live over on 58th Avenue and um, behind my townhouse, I had advanced machinery. Um, how fabrications and Omega garage door openers um, behind there. And they ran first, second, I think, and third shift. So my concern is what is the noise level going to be like? Are they running? Is it just going to be um, nine to five? What are their hours going to be like? Because I'm afraid that, you know, you're going to mark this as industrial and then we're gonna have all kinds of noise. Roxanne, do you have other questions? <laughs> yes, I also have, um, you know, I know this is supposed to be 
um, I know they're going to be, they're talking about that it's um, electrical, but everything that they're going to work on, the machinery will not be um, electrical. So I'm just concerned more about, you know, that I know that they said that there's going to be a sister building and then it's just going to become more um, industrial. And then I know the land behind those two buildings is also for sale. And then all of a sudden we have more, we've got industrial buildings all the way down the block is my, you know, it's just, it seems to be coming a cluster. And I, I feel like I'm the only resident that was notified because I saw the sign out front, not because I got something in the mail. So um, those are my questions. Okay. Thank you, Roxy. Aaron, can you respond to the question? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. Not depicted on this aerial, um, Birchwood Court actually extends further to the east, um, to the end of that um, area in blue cross hatch, where it turns north and connects back up to um, uh, Northwest 54th Avenue there. Um, and, and so when it turns north, it becomes Carter Court. And there are a number of homes on the east side of Carter Court, um, adjacent to the high school there. Um, yeah, you, you can see that um, north of this Blue Cross Hatch area, um, there's some, some forested property there. Um, yeah, actually in an unincorporated Polk County, um, you know, when or if that area will ever get annexed into the city of Johnston, I'm not certain. Um, but it, it's, um, yeah, it's not, we, would, we wouldn't see further industrial development north of this property. Um, if anything, you would see additional homes along Carter Court. Um, this is this Blue Cross Hatch area, area is the end of the PUD. It's the last of the property that can be developed within the PUD. Um, no, no further industrial uh, or no further commercial uses to be um, developed any further east of this. Do we have any uh, comments on the noise that could uh, could emanate from the businesses that are uh, being planned here? Well, you know, of course, C3 is, is currently the allowed uses of the property, and that includes such uses as truck stops, uh, lumber yards, um, car washes, you know, all, all of these types of uses um, probably would be, you know, that's the current zoning of the property. Um, expanding it to IC really doesn't change the intensity of what's already allowed there. Um, I don't see semi-traffic. Thank you for pulling up that aerial. That actually helps. You can see where um, Birchwood turns into Carter Court and connects up to Northwest City Court. Um, I don't see uh, semi-traffic going up Carter Court to 54 to get back to 86. Um, but again, I would, I would, uh, Ask Chris if um, they anticipate a large amount of semi traffic and if he knows anything about their hours of operation. Yeah, so Aaron, you, I mean, you've, you've characterized this pretty well. I, and just the, the thing that I would add on to this that may hopefully alleviate some of those concerns is that, you know, we're aligned in a lot of ways in the sense that economically these properties will be, will do better both from a rent perspective and really kind of their original intent as we would call it flex or, or flex tech as we would have marketed this. So the more office or those types of uses that, that come in here, the better economically the, the deal will do and was kind of set up that way from, from a parking perspective. So it's, it's not our goal to try to attract, you know, tenants that we would see in similar types of distribution or heavy industrial types of uses. We, you know, we have other properties that we market to that, that, that are more distribution type buildings. This is not that same type of use, but would be more to the uses that, that Aaron's describing where, you know, we would envision some storefront, um, you know, usage where it's a higher kind of finish in the front part of the building, but certainly there could be you know, straight truck deliveries or things like that in the rear and not necessarily marketing to abnormal hours. So uh, to, to what, you know, what was described is, you know, certainly the, the other commercial buildings in the same area may have similar types of traffic. It's, it's hard to know exactly what those uh, look like, but we're not anticipating anything abnormal here. 
So if I, if I hear what you're saying, if I hear correctly what you're saying, Chris, it's what your, um, what your plan is, is to have tenants in these buildings that are pretty consistent with what we otherwise see along Birchwood Court there. That is our anticipation. In fact, when we opened these buildings, we had some of the tenants that are in the neighboring buildings look at this in terms of expansion capabilities. The tenants that we're trying to attract here are both from outside of Johnston, which is good for the, the city and the tax base. But, uh, um, you know, it's it's not set up to be really a distribution style building. This it's the 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 amount of uh, truck truck traffic or really heavy industrial uses this the, the, the way that the building is set up wouldn't be conducive to that heavy type of use. Is there anyone else, uh, Cindy, can you tell, is there anyone else that would like to address the council on this while we're in a public hearing on it? Not that I am aware of. No one has indicated that. Does the council have any other questions for either the developer or for Aaron? If not, we will close the public hearing then at 749. Whoops, there we go, Cindy. <laughs> We have closed the public hearing. We do have um, the action item in front of us, and that is to consider first reading of ordinance number 1047. Do we have a motion to approve uh, ordinance number 1047? So move approve. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I do want to say uh, I do appreciate uh, Ms. Hughes being with us this evening and sharing her concerns. Uh, I think we had some good discussion and good comments back in response to what was said. Hopefully we alleviate, alleviate this, those concerns, but I would encourage you, Ms. Hughes, to continue to uh, pay, attention, pen, pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhood. And uh, you know, at any point, uh, if concerns do develop, uh, please bring those to us. We do have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Martin. Yes. Ready. Yes. Soroka. Yes. Pope. Yes. Evans. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 5B, another public hearing on the matter of adoption of plans, specifications from the contract, estimate of cost for Northwest Beaver Drive overlay phase three, and consider resolution number 21-12, adopting plan specifications, form of contract, and estimate of cost. Consider construction of bids. Consider resolution number 21-13, making award of contract, and resolution number 21-18, approving contract and bond. And we will open this public hearing at 7.51. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, Cindy, if you could open the final plans there. That'll give kind of a, a map of where we're talking about. Um, would like to say on January 12th, the city received bids for the Northwest Beaver Drive overlay uh, phase three project, which includes a trail between Merle Hay Road and Northwest 66th Avenue. Um, we had a total of six bidders on the project. It was, it was positive to see that we had this many bidders. Um, it's the largest number of bids that we've seen on an overlay project um, from past projects from phase one and two. So that was good to see that we had some competition out there. Uh, HR Green's opinion of probable cost was $3,166,025. The low bid received was $2,761,000. Uh, this represents approximately a 10% um, underneath the uh, engineer's estimate. I'm always welcome that. Uh, certified bid tab shows that uh, Grimes Asphalt and Paving Corporation was the low bidder. 
we uh, have worked on previous projects with the uh, the low bidder. Um, they actually did Northwest Beaver Drive overlay project um, phase one and two, which ran from our north city limits down to Merle Hay Road. Um, so we've got a good track record and a good history with the contractor. Um, staff and the engineer do recommend approval of the project. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council have questions for Matt? So Matt, Hi. Council Cope here, is, is this the final phase of this project? Yes, this is the third and final phase. Great, thank you. Matt, does, uh, this is uh, Councilperson Martin. Um, does this include the bearing the electrical lines? Yes, this project will is, uh, Midam actually is putting a plan together um, for placing the overhead electric to underground. They've been working with the residents and getting um, easements to place that in where they can, as well as their switch gear and transformers. Okay, thank you. And are they paying for the cost of that, uh, Matt? No, they've gone back to their old model, which um, they take the relocation cost for their overhead, deduct it from the um, underground, what it would take to go underground, and then we would pay the difference. Okay, but it doesn't sound like it added too much. Obviously, it didn't add significantly to the cost of the project, so that's good. Yeah, they've uh, they've been working with the residents out there. Most of the residents are um, happy that the power is going underground and have been granting um, the the switchgear easements as well as a, a five foot easement to run that electrical in at, at no cost. Other questions for Matt? Cindy, can you tell if there's anyone that uh, is with us that would like to address the council on this? No one is indicating that they are, nor did they earlier when I was getting overrun by them. <laughs> Very good. Well, Matt, it's always great to hear that uh, bids came in under um, what we estimated, and in this case, considerably under what we estimated. So that's what a little uh, good competition will do for you. So Yes, it's... The, the low bid is welcome. And, and we sounds like we got a quality uh, contractor uh, besides. So that's, that's always good news as well. Yeah, we've, we've worked well with Grimes Asphalt uh, in the past. So looking forward to it. Great. Well, we'll go ahead then and we will close the public hearing at 8.55. Seven fifty-five. 7.55, yes. <laughs> Let's not make it any later than it is. So do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-12? Move approval, Cope. Second, second We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council member ready? Yes. Taroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-13? So moved, Martin. A second, Swish. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Soroka? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. And do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-18? So moved, Martin. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Cope. Second, second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, will please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Oh. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to the non consent agenda. Item 8A consider approval of the third reading and adoption and publication of ordinance number 1046, an official zoning map amendment for approximately 8.93 acres from AR to R1 100 and A 
with A overlay. The subject property is located at 11087 Northwest Towner Drive, PZ case number 20-23. And Jim, you indicated that the developer would uh, like for this to be tabled this evening? Yes, that, that's what they indicated. Okay. This is Clayton. They had requested it be tabled to the February 1st meeting. Um, this allows them a few additional, a little additional time to work through some development related um, review with the preliminary plan. Okay. Do we have a motion to table this item until the February 1st meeting? So moved. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8B, consider approval of resolution number 21-22, a resolution approving the site plan for Clinton Mechanical at 8951 Thomas Avenue. This is Clayton Ender again. Set Point Mechanical has submitted a new site plan. Um, you may recall the name. They had done a site plan on Northwest 88th Street, um, kind of up there behind the uh, Price Chopper, Jane, La Jane's International Hair College. Um, due to some unresolved uh, private easement issues that came about uh, or became known after you saw this at, for approval, um, they've elected to move to a new site. Um, so kind of going through a quick little summary of that site, um, Cindy, you might want to pull up the site plan um, for reference. Uh, this site is uh, within the Windsor Office Park PUD and you did is a PC professional commerce park zoning um, and as proposed the the use and uh, layout of the site is consistent with our zoning district as well as our comprehensive plan uh, which does show the area to be neighborhood mixed use um, as a primarily office based user um, that would be consistent with our comprehensive plan uh, there'd be a single access onto Thomas Avenue into their parking lot um, and there'd also be a pedestrian connection from the from the road into the site so uh, pedestrians could get from the sidewalk into the front door. Um, the site's kind of laid out um, with the building kind of on that south southwest portion and parking on the north northwest um, and they'll have access to all appropriate city utilities and uh, have appropriate uh, fire protection. Um, one item of note is there is a dry bottom detention basin shown on the rear of the site um, that would outlet to the north. Uh, the applicant would be responsible to acquire additional private easement to allow for that drainage or alternatively, they would have to design an alternative outlet to get that water back down to Thomas Avenue. Um, the applicant is in discussions with the adjoining uh, property owners which to my understanding is the uh, developer of the office park itself. Um, to resolve that issue. Ar architecture for the building, same as you saw it in the past. I did provide you architectural elevations if you wish to look at those. Um, I believe the one modification was the location of the deck, which I believe went from the side to the front, um, but uh, largely the same, same building. Um, I have nothing else really to add here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Also have any questions? Clayton, I just have one question. Is there a, a residential unit on top of this building? Uh, no, per the uh, floor plan uh, that was included in the architectural elevations, they're not showing one. Um, I defer to the applicant on if there's a, a desire or intention. Yeah, uh, Clayton, hey, this is Patrick. No, there isn't. It's all office. Thank you. Any other questions? Not, and you need to take me back to the agenda. There we go. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-22? So moved, Cope. Second, okay. Mark. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Council member Reddy? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Cope? 
Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8C, consider approval of the following items related to piece of case 20-28. Cross Haven North, located north of Little Beaver Creek and east of Northwest 100th Street. Resolution 21-19, a resolution approver, approving the preliminary plat for Cross Haven North. Resolution 21-20, a resolution approving the const construction plans for Cross Haven Plat 9. Good evening, Clayton and there again. Uh, Cross Haven 1 LLC has proposed 125 lots for single family homes north of Little Beaver Creek and east of Northwest 100th Street. Uh, this uh, plat, preliminary plat was approved in 2017. So some members on the council may recall this and find this familiar, um, largely the same um, layout as previous, uh, a few uh, less lots than previous, I believe it's four or five less lots, um, kind of a long water meadow circle. Um, I'm going to go through just a quick summary of everything for everyone's benefit here. And Cindy, perhaps you can pull open the um, preliminary plat and just kind of go to one of the overall sheets. This uh, property, it's part of the Cross Haven PUD and um, utilizes um, uh, single family uses for this area. And as proposed, uh, we are consistent with the approved zoning. Um, as for our comprehensive plan, we do show it as suburban residential, um, and we do further identify this within our Little Beaver Creek focus area, uh, trying to preserve a open space and floodplain um, on the site, um, which they do through the uh, PUD requirements. A um, little history here. Uh, in 2017, we were under our old uh, floodplain maps. Shortly thereafter, we did adopt the new FEMA maps, which did include a vast majority north of Little Beaver Creek within the floodplain. Um, that was um, disputed, uh, protested with uh, FEMA, and it did go through their process and has since been removed um, from the floodplain um, through some additional modeling that the applicant uh, provided. And um, it is my understanding that that was the a primary cause of delay for development north of the creek was resolution to the floodplain through FEMA. Um, as for utilities, it's going to have access to sanitary sewer and water. Um, Stormwater is managed through a series of open ditches along the roadside, as you see south of the Little Beaver Creek, and select areas of uh, storm sewer itself. Um, there will be sidewalk throughout the site. The road network throughout the development is uh, primarily a single uh, collector level road, Northwest 82nd Avenue that runs east west toward Northwest 100th Street. There's a looped uh, public street to the south, Water Meadow Circle. And then on the eastern side, there's three cul de sacs. Kind of in that northwest corner is uh, Cross Haven Townhomes, which is a separate development plan. Um, those are private streets to the north. Um, so there's only the single access to Northwest 100th Street, and furthermore, there's only a single access to the south across Little Beaver Creek. Uh, to the north, there is access, but it is restricted due to Camp Dodge. Um, so emergency vehicles could use it, but the general public could not. Um, we did discuss this in, um, in detail in 2017 and even all the way back to the initiation of the zoning, uh, whether or not there needed to be a secondary uh, crossing of Little Beaver Creek to support north of, uh, to support uh, that cross connection. And back in oh, 2006, 2007, it was agreed that uh, Hubble would be responsible for, responsible for upgrading the bridge at Northwest 100th Street in lieu of uh, installing a secondary bridge uh, within this development. They have since completed that connect or that um, reconstruction of Northwest 100th Street bridge. Um, now, kind of along those same lines, there has been concern raised by our fire department on um, emergency access to the site, uh, specifically um, that eastern half of the site. Um, when you first come in, you got kind of looped streets, both north and south, that provide some alternative routes in the event of any obstructions on any of the roads. 
but we kind of got a bottleneck there at that midpoint. And then um, with the three cul-de-sacs, there's not cross connection. And that raised concern that if there's any type of obstruction on Northwest 82nd Avenue, uh, an emergency vehicle may be delayed or not possible to respond to an emergency. There was considerable um, debate at Planning and Zoning Commission uh, regarding this. Um, in my staff report, I did kind of outline a summary there. In general, there was kind of four ver uh, various ideas that were kind of thrown out as possibilities um, to maybe resolve that. Um, the first one being um, to loop those cul-de-sac streets north of Northwest 82nd Avenue on that northeast corner. Uh, the engineer for the project did indicate that um, it had been explored back in 2017, but due to the grading of the site and how stormwater uh, flows through the site um, without significant redesign, that would not be feasible. Um, a second alternative that was discussed was to get a temporary access road from Northwest 86th Street um, west to Northwest 82nd Avenue here. At some point in the future, that road will connect through permanently, but there was discussion, should there be a temporary connection at this time being? Um, the, the problem there is we don't have control of it as a city and it's under separate ownership. So there may be an unwillingness to, to do it. Additionally, part of that area over by Northwest 86th Street is actually an unincorporated Polk County. So you do have a jurisdictional issue as well. So um, maybe possible, but not likely viable, uh, kind of sounded like. Um, third alternative was whether or not there should be a um, new uh, vehicle rated bridge crossing Little Beaver Creek, kind of in that southeastern corner where our parkland is. Um, we'd be acquiring parkland on the east side of the creek as well. Um, the concern there is that would be a significant cost to install another bridge. It would kind of be, it would be inconsistent with the original approval with the zoning that said upgrade 100th Street in lieu of the second bridge. Um, and so without a cost estimate, it didn't really come across as a viable alternative. The fourth alternative, which really kind of popped out is what, what seemed like maybe the most viable is uh, there is a bike path that runs south of the lots along Northwest 82nd Avenue. And that could provide an alternative emergency access to those homes on the east. We would just need to verify with the construction plans for that set from the, for those later phases um, that the trail is constructed of appropriate width and, depth and uh, alignment to allow for emergency vehicle movement. Um, so ultimately, PNZ did add a condition that a, a mutually agreeable secondary emergency access shall be completed prior to construction plan approval for Plat 10, which is that eastern phase. And the intent there was to try and keep the, the options open um, and not lock us into one, one solution over another. Um, but the general discussion was, it seems like... Uh, there should be a simple solution and uh, that that bike trail might be the simple solution to provide an alternative route. Um, so I did include that as a condition in the approval of the resolution um, that they'd have to do that prior to plat 10. So with that, I'd uh, answer any questions if you have going into any further detail. I do believe we have representatives of the uh, developer here as well if they wish to add anything or if you have questions of them. Do you have any questions? Clayton, um, can you go, go ahead, Council Person Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask Clayton the options of access and the fourth one that seemed the most feasible, which was to upgrade a proposed bike trail, proposed, right? Not an existing bike trail to right. handle emergency vehicles. Would this, uh, was, would that, um, option be wholly on the city to um, pay for? Uh, no, it would be the responsibility of the developer to provide um, appropriate means of secondary emergency access at their expense. 
So it would satisfy the need for uh, emergency access, but it wouldn't it wouldn't satisfy the uh, eventual 1,200 plus trips when we're trying to have only 500. Our zoning calls for 500 trips out of uh, out of uh, a neighborhood. So we could solve the emergency safety issue, but not the congestion issue. Uh, no, that would not solve the congestion issue in the short term. Um, the solution to that would be an extension of Northwest 82nd Avenue east to Northwest 86th Street, or alternatively, Northwest 82nd Avenue west to Highway 141 and through the Beaver Creek Golf Course. <clears throat> Clayton, yes. So, uh, could you help? I don't. I don't know if you have control over this. What we're seeing on the screen right now, but I do not. Okay, maybe you, you and, and Cindy can kind of work together. But so you talk about a plot, the eastern plot. So are, there, are these plot ten, or you made a reference to something in ten? So is that? Can you kind of show where? where that is, is that? Yeah, so plat nine, which is also the construction plans under consideration tonight, that's the uh, extension of the of Northwest 82nd Avenue on the Western half and that Southern Loop Street. Um, you'll see a temporary, uh, Cindy, the other side. Keep going, west, left, left. Your other left. <laughs> so. So does it end kind of where that bulb is? Yeah, that'd be a temporary uh, turn vehicle turnaround there. So that's that's nine, and that's what that's, we're. Yeah, that's nine, and then um, the number of plats that may occur on the on the eastern half, it may be one, two, more, but um, it'd be at least plat ten on the eastern half if they did it all as one. And can so can you also then show where the bike trail that you're talking about this? potential emergency will that run alongside 82nd avenue there it's south of those so the lots that are on the south side of 82nd avenue it's on the south side of those lots so kind of where she's running her cursor and then where does it okay so it's so is where is it on on plot on the not on the, on the western plot does the trail does the trail go all the way to 100th Street? Yeah, it does. It runs behind those lots all the way over to the western there. Then it goes up to 82nd, and then over to 100th. Um, okay. Um, the concern is really the eastern half because uh, we have alternative emergency routes with the Loop Street to the south, and then the private Loop Street to the north. Um, that if there's an obstruction on any of those. We have multiple paths through there, but we got that kind of in that um, midpoint of the of the plat. And this and we, provide an alternative. Are we, are we approving both nine and ten tonight, or is it just nine? You're approving the overall preliminary plat north of the creek, but just the construction plans for nine, which is that western half. Okay. Right. They would have to come back with construction plans for ten or later. And do I understand it right? When they come back for 10, they have to provide another access? Yeah, or as it's written, they, we would have to uh, have a mutually agreeable secondary emergency access. And it was intentionally left uh, open-ended to, to allow uh, problem solving and options to, to arise as we review that plat 10. So would the would the the bike the the bike route as an option we have to be built with thicker concrete or how would you handle that or is it since it would only be used for a short term that's not really an issue or how has that any thought been given to that or is that just I would defer to um, either the fire department or the project engineer on um, what requirements would be needed to allow that to be used as a emergency access. I don't know if maybe if Chief Clark is on, if he has any comments there. Yes, council members and 
mayor um yes it would have to be thicker to hold the weight of a fire engine and are you chief are you are you satisfied with that uh that option of using the bike trail as an emergency vehicle route yes as long as we've got another another way in the problem is that I saw was with such a long extension, if we were to have a water main break, uh, chances are it could take out a road because the, the mains cross uh, 82nd Avenue in at least two different places, north to south. And if that, if we were to have a water main break and it were to compromise the street, so we not only had a water issue, but an access issue, um, it would severely compromise our ability to put out a fire in, in a home and we could have multiple homes uh, burn at that time. And so at least if we have access, we can still haul water in there, but we have to have uh, a means of access that will support the weight of our rigs. So that was that was a compromise that was offered and, and we'll look into uh, other options and solutions. And again, there may be other options for a road to the east by the time they fill up that first part of the development and we look at construction plans for the second half. Hey Clayton, this is John. Just one real quick question. Um, would this need to be oversized trail? It doesn't seem like 10 foot wide would be wide enough for emergency vehicles. Would this need to be 15 feet or are they still proposing just 10 feet? Again, that's a, have to review with uh, those construction plans and in cons consultation with the fire department and the project engineer. Yeah, John, this is Matt. Or your lane width is 12, 12 and a half feet. And that's on. So if you're thinking of a 26 foot road on a normal subdivision, you've generally got 12 and a half feet um, plus your curbs. So you would probably want to oversize it. The other issue I, sh issue I see if you're going to access it from Water Meadow Circle is actually making the turn to get onto the bike trail. I believe you'd access it there between lots 50 and 49. Or, yeah, there. Yeah, it's right there. So that's a tight turning radius for, for our fire apparatus. If that's an item of uh, interest to be reviewed, um, the action tonight is to approve the construction plans for plat nine. So you want to address that tonight if the council desires. Um, Clayton, I'm having I'm having more trouble dealing with the outlet, the single outlet for the um, 1,200 trips a day. Um, I understand we had a, our last city council meeting. We were talking about another development, and that was for a much smaller area, and there was the concern on the trips. And I understand that we look to future roads to solve this issue for us, but those, those might be well down the road in terms of when they get built. Um, so I, I'm having some concerns figuring out what to do here because we are approving a plat and then we are approving the plans. Which part of that would, would it not be the plat that would be the concerning port, you know, if, if if uh, if it was felt that the single outlet wasn't going to work, that would be the plat on the plat. Yes, that we need to make our vote known. Yes, the um, the plat is where the waiver of the 500 trips uh, occurs. Um, and kind of a little history there. There was considerable debate on this in 2017. Uh, when this got initially approved, um, and really the, to my recollection, the kind of what was kind of what we sat on was Northwest 82nd Avenue is 
a collector level road, so a wider road. And then Northwest 100th Street is a minor arterial road. So really you've got two higher uh, um, capacity roadways um, for this area. Referring back to the development that is a little oh, over behind Heartland Stables, um, that's uh, the, the roadways are uh, 29 feet, so they do meet that collective level width, um, but it, it certainly lends itself more to a local street network versus more of a through street um, collector arterial network. So um, it, it doesn't necessarily alleviate the fact that there is only the one access. Um, I would note that the uh, Northwest 82nd Avenue is already constructed in to that western entrance of the townhomes, that um, western water meadow circle. The western half of the townhomes is already completed. So really the ability to get a second access to the street is not really there. Um, but I certainly understand if you have concerns with it. Okay. I Okay. Thank you. So Clayton, the, the width of 82nd, I don't know if it's Avenue or Street, is 29 feet. That's what the proposed width is. That's correct. And our typical, a typical street would be 26 feet. Is that right? Correct. A local level street would be 26. Uh, collector level streets start at 29. So that's kind of the the, the trade-off of a lot of waiving the 500 and going above 500 is is a requirement that the street be wider that's right okay. and it's just the just 82nd avenue that is the wider street none of these other streets are wider is that right correct the loop street and the three cul-de-sac bulbs are 26 foot mm -hmm. So Clayton, where are we uh, where are we at? Um, well, I don't know if you need to ask any questions of the applicant or their representative, or if they have anything additional they wish to add. This might be a good time for that. Council, any questions? Well, I, I got I got my answer on the coldest uh, the trip uh, issue, but now. Uh, the plan issue and the thought that perhaps in the future we're going to use the bike trail for the emergency route for the fire engine and now we're talking and then there was brought up can the fire engine make the turn off the road to get onto the bike trail and if they we need to make some sort of restriction in the pl construction plans we'd have to make it now is that correct Clayton have I worked it out there Yes, this would be the time to make any modifications to those plans. Um, I'd maybe defer to the project engineer if they have any comments on the ability to make those turning movements. Clayton, this is Caleb Smith with McClure. Um, yeah, the biggest issue with uh, utilizing the bike trail um, for the fire access is going to be able to navigate those turns. Um, coming in between 50 and 49 should not be a problem if that's the direction that we want to plan on. Um, I know at PNZ we'd also talked about coming down between 60 and 61 as well as there's a planned bike trail uh, connection through there. Um, making those turns, um, we obviously did not plan on fire truck access with our current layout, but with some revisions, I think we could uh, make that navigable for a fire truck, um, specifically between 71 and 72. We've got some little extra space in there that we could we could utilize uh, to make that uh, that turn doable. I, I think we've got the space to do it. Um, and uh, if widening the section out from a 10 foot to a 12 foot section would be agreeable, I, I think we've got the capacity to do that um, from just a layout perspective here. So I think, I think it's something we can make happen here um, and um, don't think that we have any specific issues other than we probably just need to walk through with fire and make sure that we're good to go with the plan um, with, with whatever direction that uh, staff and, and uh, um, our client is looking to do on this situation. 
Caleb, this is Clayton. Is there uh, a time sensitive reason to have the construction plans approved tonight or um, would it be appropriate to have council table the approve the plat and table the construction plans so we can work through that issue that that item on the construction plans? Um, I know we were just trying to get things uh, finalized and wrapped up um, so that we have um, final plans that we could send out for bidding and contracting, getting ready to go for uh, spring construction. I'd have to defer to uh, um, Eric or Steve with Hubble, who I believe are online as well, to answer that question. Clayton, this is Steve Mosley with Hubble. Uh, I can I can address this. We would really like to move forward with construction documents uh, for this plat right now, uh, so we can get started on plat nine as soon as spring conditions allow. Uh, part of the documents tonight in the resolution is that uh, prior to the approval of the construction plans for plat 10 or later plats is that we'd have a mutually agreed upon secondary emergency access uh, between the developer, us and the city. And uh, if at that time, when we move on to plat 10, we cannot get, uh, we have to modify that bike path to allow for turning movements to go between lots 49 and 50 and plat nine, we'll make those necessary adjust, adjustments to make that work. Now at that later time, we may also have a, you know, the extension of the, uh, the East West street there, 82nd Avenue as a possibility. So the bike path at that point as a secondary access may not even be needed. Uh, we would just like to follow the, the recommendations in the resolution as to having that secondary access agreed upon between us and the city uh, when we move through the construction plans for plat 10 or later. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is Clayton again. Chief Clark, do you think uh, addressing the turning movements with plat 10 would be uh, appropriate? Mayor and Council and Clayton, yes, I think that would be very appropriate. I'm not concerned about that second half at this point. I think uh, I agree with the developer and uh, their engineer that that's something that can be worked out later and there may be more options in the future. So that's kind of what the discussion with P&Z was is that at least it gives us flexibility to look at options in the future, um, but it should not hold up uh, the approval what's before you tonight as far as uh, the entire plat and then the construction plans for the first half of it. Also have any concerns about that? Okay. I think the applicant hears that uh, we're, we have a strong interest in this and would be concerned if uh, uh, this wasn't addressed at the appropriate time, so. Is there any further discussion on this? Cindy, could you take me back to the agenda, please? If there's no further questions, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-19? Move approval, Cope. Second, Martin. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Sorry, Councilmember Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21 20? So approved. So moved, Martin. Second, Evans. Yes. We have a motion and a second. Send me vote, please. Councilmember Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 8D. Consider resolution number 21-14, authorizing entering, entering into professional services agreement with Venue Works for management and town center venues. Good evening, Adam. Mayor and Council. Um, this is Adam. Uh, in 2020, the city issued a request for qualifications for firms interested in managing the town center venues, which include the ice rink, uh, the concessions building, and the stage off of the city hall. 
Uh, VenueWorks is one of two firms that the Economic Development Committee interviewed um, in 2020. Uh, and we were directed to begin negotiations of contract for them uh, for consideration by the full city council. Uh, so that's what we have in front of you this evening uh, is a, uh, what we believe is a final draft of a uh, three-year agreement with VenueWorks to manage those facilities. Uh, it has been reviewed by the Economic Development Committee as well as the Town Center Amenities Committee. Uh, but want to give uh, VenueWorks a chance to introduce themselves with a short background um, and some of their key staff here before I walk through some of the key points of the contract. Uh, so we do have uh, Steve Peters here, CEO of VenueWorks, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, any other key staff along with a little background. Hi, I'm Steve Peters. I'm, um, I'm sorry, I uh, my uh, camera may not be on here. Um, I have that all worked out. I'm Steve Peters. I'm president and owner of VenueWorks. Uh, our offices are names Iowa. We also have with us uh, Tim Sullivan. He's our CFO. Uh, Trisha Gagno, a vice president with us, and will be overseeing the account. And Quincy Keck will be our manager for the yard. Uh, we're all here ready to help you uh, and answer any questions tonight. Uh, VenueWorks has been in uh, business uh, 25 years this year. Uh, we're headquartered in Ames. We manage arenas, theaters, and convention centers and outdoor facilities like amphitheaters and uh, sports facilities uh, around the country, but uh, mostly concentrated in the upper Midwest. So in, in Iowa, we manage Stevens Auditorium in Ames, the Bridgeview Center in Ottumwa, uh, the River Center Adler Theater in Davenport, uh, McGrath Amphitheater, the Paramount Theater, I'm on Ice Arena, and the Alliant Powerhouse all in Cedar Rapids. Um, that's typical of the sorts of venues we manage and um, we're eager to go to work for you to make uh, the Town Center Yard a very special place. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and also just point out, I guess your CFO is a, a Johnston resident as well. So I, we're very excited that you guys have some background here in the community as well. Uh, so I'll just walk through some of the key points of the contract. Uh, and at the end here, uh, Steve and I can answer any questions council might have. Uh, so the contract is proposed for a three-year duration um, with two optional three years extensions uh, that could be, uh, contract could be terminated by either party uh, with 180 days notice. Uh, as part of the contract, VenueWorks would have access and use of the partner's office space, which is in City Hall. Uh, that's directly across from the mayor's and the council's office there off of uh, city council chambers. Uh, we did have a discussion at the last committee meeting that uh, we just want to make sure that that is furnished uh, kind of in an appropriate fashion to the rest of the city hall, uh, kept orderly, uh, and that we uh, work through any access challenges with VenueWorks uh, as this relationship sort of evolves. So that is now in the proposed contract here uh, that uh, those things will occur and that uh, the city maintains authority over hours of access and authorized card holders. Uh, the venue area that would be managed by VenueWorks uh, consists of the ice rink, the yard and the concessions building. Uh, they would also have use of the stage, the trailhead and other areas with property owners consent. So obviously we'll hold uh, COVID willing, a number of larger events out here in the future um, that will require cooperation with some of the future private property owners in there, uh, as well as potential use of some city property, such as the trailhead going forward. Uh, the duties and responsibilities of VenueWorks are fairly comprehensive. Um, they'll be in charge of uh, event marketing, uh, scheduling those events, ticketing in instances in which there will be tickets. Um, we think those are probably gonna be fewer and farther between, uh, most of it uh, being a fairly open space. Um, security, uh, coordinated with uh, our police officer and in the regulations of uh, city code, uh, licensing, accounting, promotion of events and activities, uh, as well as uh, the actual operations, cleaning of the concessions building, um, and the hours and operations of that, I will notice a uh, note are, uh, to be determined. Uh, snow removal uh, within that concession building area and then the ice rink arena. Uh, and then they'll also be in charge of uh, attracting sponsors as well uh, for the ice rink and those festivals and activities that will occur there. So uh, we do have a public safety meeting. I think that'll be coming up here in February or, or late January uh, to discuss, discuss some of the alcohol policy within the yard. Uh, there's a lot of complexities here as we cross through easements and public and private properties. 
Um, but I think we're working towards a pretty good game plan to ensure uh, uh, that uh, events can be held uh, in a safe and responsible manner uh, with the alcohol policy that's uh, uh, in line with the state and the city code. Uh, city and town center oversight. Uh, so the uh, Venue Works general manager provide quarterly updates of the financials. Uh, an annual operating budget would be delivered to the city by October 1st of each year to coordinate with our budgeting process. That budget would also include a maximum exposure, sort of a worst case scenario budget. Uh, so that in an event of, uh, you know, another pandemic or um, poor weather or other circumstances, uh, we know the kind of active risk of the city and of future partners uh, on the private developers that would be also contributing towards the town center association would be going forward. And we would also receive monthly financials um, for review as well. Um, I'll also note in here that uh, this contract is uh, being signed by the city, but the intention is, is that uh, most of the responsibilities um, of the city would be assigned over to the town center association when that organization is stood up and there's other private partners helping fund this organization. Um, that isn't to say that the city won't have a solar role on that town center association board and in the interim, the town center's amenity committee uh, would be providing that oversight uh, with a Hanson representative participating in those discussions as well. Uh, as far as actual management fees, uh, we do have, we have asked a lot out of AnyWorks and we certainly appreciate their assistance to date, uh, but we have a number of other pre-opening sort of activities that we are going to use some assistance from them on as far as interior design of the uh, concessions building and how the layout of that looks like, uh, as well as just beginning the, uh, the finalizing of the budgeting process uh, beginning to look at what these event, events are um, that are going to be taking place in the next three years in more detail, uh, obtaining those sponsors. Uh, and so we have a $3,000 a month fee um, for Venue Works for uh, participating in that activities. Uh, that is tentatively capped at $12,000. In instance, COVID delays the uh, town center opening and activities uh, beyond uh, the anticipated opening date of sort of mid-summer here of 2021. Uh, once operations are underway, uh, the base management fee is $4,000 a month, with a 3% annual increase built in there for the cost of inflation. Uh, there's also a sponsorship commission component to this. Uh, so as Venue Works would be attracting all of those sponsors, they would be receiving 15% of those gross revenues uh, brought in uh, by those sponsorships. Uh, and then we do have a programming incentive that would be detailed and laid out um, at a future date, uh, but that incentive would be up to $10,000 for achieving uh, mutually agreed upon uh, parameters of event activities uh, and successfully uh, holding those events. Uh, in an instance in which uh, the budget expectations aren't met, uh, that uh, incentive would not be provided or it would be refunded back to the city or the association. Uh, just as a reminder of kind of the budget conversation we had um, about a month ago, um, we do have a pro forma that we've discussed with Venue Works, um, and we'll dive deeper into that once the, the contract is signed and we're working through the specific events. They're looking at a $52,000 potential subsidy for the first year. Uh, the current city budget accounts for up to $100,000 uh, for the Town Center Association event activities. Uh, so obviously we'll learn a lot, I think, here in the first year or two as things get underway, uh, but we're certainly hopeful that uh, they'll be uh, performing at a high level and, and uh, not be requiring that full uh, city budget um, that we've set aside for 2021, 2022. Uh, there was also some conversations when we were working through the Ignite project uh, that we wanted to make sure that employees and contractors had background checks, particularly if they're uh, working with kids, uh, and which will be the case with the uh, ice skating. Uh, so background checks are going to be required uh, as part of this contract and uh, the insurance provisions in the contract have been reviewed by the city's agents. Uh, so we've uh, met the venue work staff. Uh, and as I noted, uh, this has gone through a couple of committees for review uh, with some amendments in there, uh, but wanted to make sure the full city council had an opportunity to meet that key staff. Uh, and with that, I have to answer any questions uh, as with uh, Steve and his team. Council have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question, Adam. I, it came up off and on, and I, I should have talked about it sooner, but what, uh, what discussions have you had in terms of the, um, the events that are going to be brought into the town center? Is there um, some description uh, about types of events? For example, 
you know, I see the town center as being a great place for art shows or uh, a wine tasting kind of event. But um, perhaps the town center, there might be a group that maybe is not so universally liked, wanted to, to rent the space or even a political type group that would be controversial. What kind of language do we have in there about who gets to rent the space? That's an excellent question. As far as the, the actual events that would be put on by Venue Works and or the city, um, we have tried to outline some of that in previous conversations and you know, I'll let Steve maybe comment on uh, what some of those potential outlined events would be. Uh, as far as rentals, there's certainly anticipated to be uh, the possibility of some private use of the ice skating rink. Uh, you know, that would presumably very, be very apolitical in nature uh, type of a use as well as maybe some summer spring activities uh, within the uh, what would be the concrete pad that is the ice rink in the winter, uh, potentially uh, weddings or, or other sorts of events of that nature. We don't have a you know a defined uh, policy or plan in place right now for uh, what those private events might look like. I know the primary focus is certainly that the town center and the yard is open to the public, um, but uh, I think that's a good question. Probably something we'd need to work through uh, as we start to delineate what those specific events and the rental policy would be. I think it would be advisable to have some sort of conversation about that so that if we get a group that doesn't seem to fit Johnston's intention, that we have a fair way of making that, make, making that plain, that we're not just picking and choosing. And maybe I would just add that, uh, you know, certainly the city is sort of in holding the reins here for the first year or two as uh, private development gets underway. Um, but uh, this contract, as a noted, would be assigned over to the Town Center Association, which the city would have a representative on, um, but uh, not necessarily total control over outside of the use of city property um, going forward. So there would be an association board that ultimately would probably have some of that uh, input uh, in deciding what sort of private events would occur there as well. Thank you. Adam, unless, um, I know, Councilman Mark, are you finished? I don't I'm know. done, thank you. I just wanna, I mean, this is public space, right? This, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's public property with an easement uh, over to the Town Center Association, which uh, then is offered control and use of that space. So obviously public, I just I kind of Council Person Martin's questions about limiting who might rent it. I think we have to be really careful about that. I mean, there's a, this, considering this as public space, I'm sure that's not what she's in, intending, but I just be very careful when you're talking about public space and trying to kind of pick winners and losers who can rent it. So I think we just have to be really careful about that. I agree. We need to be careful. I don't, I don't want to pick winners and losers either, but I, you know, uh, let's, uh, there are some, there might be some things like a wet t-shirt contest. I don't know. Some things might be less savorable, savorable than others. And I just want to have a conversation. If we're, if, if we're going to say, yep, that's fine. I just need to know that that's the, that we had that conversation and we thought about that. That's very yeah, think, uh, yeah. Be careful what on public land, how, you know, what it, we don't have as much control as, as a private property owners do have in kind of limiting some of those things. We just have to be cognizant of that. So that being said, I should comment on um, a, a couple of the events that uh, have been kind of outlined in the committee discussions uh, for potential um, taking place in 2021. Uh, are you talking to me? This is Steve. I'd be happy to talk about some of the things we put into our presentation that we were talking about. Um, maybe day just in and day out. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, if you could just quickly highlight a, a few of those events for those that haven't uh, seen that presentation. Yeah, so we think there are um, sort of a few different types of events. In the one category, there'd be day in and day out sorts of things uh, in season when uh, the ice sheet is open and skates are being rented, uh, just uh, having lunch in the park uh, on a sunny summer day. 
uh, those things will be going on. We'd have the concession stand open. Special events are sort of built around seasons. Things we're thinking about was 4th of July celebrations and a Halloween spooktacular and a Thanksgiving um, display, maybe arts and crafts, get ready for Christmas, a winter wonderland, maybe with um, people dressed in Dickens costumes and singing Christmas carols and caroling around with other kinds of uh, crafts and food and drink on uh, available. Uh, Valentine's on the rink, uh, planting seeds for summer, Uncle Sam Jam, that was a more 4th of July thing. The summer splash, of course, you got the splash pad. Um, there will be uh, festivals, I think, car shows, ongoing farmer's market we'd like to have there, uh, themed family skate nights. It's an open space, and it's one that it wouldn't be easily controlled. If you wanted to put something up that's real commercial, like concerts that are, um, you know, we need to be able to sell tickets for a $50 ticket for 2,000 people or something, this isn't probably that sort of a, of a place. It's where you might have the, um, the uh, Air Force Band performing for free. Um, so uh, it is very much a family oriented place. It's gonna, uh, we're gonna work hard to give it that uh, flavor right from the beginning. And um, we'll be um, writing, we'll, we normally for any venue we work with, we would write booking policies that uh, the clients, so in this case, the city would approve uh, so that uh, we're all on the same page about uh, booking procedures and uh, what we would do. Of course, any other event that's coming in, an organization wanted to rent it, there are certain um, insurance and liability obligations and so forth. We'd ask them to pick up if they were using the space um, for their own purposes. And maybe just add as well, I think we've had a little light discussion kind of late in the game that uh, maybe some multicultural events based off of some of the strategic planning conversations would be something to incorporate into the, uh, the activity list going forward as well. Definitely, definitely. And we also did decide that uh, given that we don't want to, um, we want to take very good care of the office space that we'll be using. Um, I decided with Adam that if Motley Crue comes to town, they're going to hang out in his office. So it'll be all right. <laughs> Thank you. Adam, do we have anything else on this? That's all the information I have for you. Okay. Does the council have any further questions? If not, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-14? I move, Suresh. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yeah. Soroka? Yes. Oh, yes. Motion passed. Item 8E, consider resolution number 21-21, approving a tree removal plan for Ignite Gateway Recreation Complex. Uh, Aaron Wolf again. And uh, Ignite would like to be in demolition of their the uh, now vacant industrial buildings that are located back behind Sonic and, and the Jimmy Johns properties. Uh, they'd also like to begin necessary tree removal on the site. Um, again, this would be the future uh, site of the, the Gateway Athletic Complex. Um, demolition is easily accomplished. Uh, we typically do that by issuance of a, of a demolition permit here in our building department. Um, something we do pretty routinely on an administrative basis. Uh, tree removal, however, is typically done as part of a site plan. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we're presenting the proposed tree removal plan to the council tonight. And of course, a site plan would come at a later date. Um, of course, the idea of seeking council approval on tree clearing is generally to avoid clear cutting of sites and to, to make sure we're lending due consideration to, to preservation of mature trees whenever possible. Um, but in this instance, the proposed use is the future home of soccer, track, and, and cricket fields, and that makes the job of, of tree preservation difficult. Um, our parks department has had a chance to do some tree inventory on the site. And uh, they've identified a number of trees that are, are of a desirable species and they're of an appropriate size. 
that would allow for transplanting off-site. And those trees are primarily located behind the poly eyes site. Um, back at the rear of that property, there's an area that was formerly planted as, as forest reserve by the property owners. Um, so tonight, resolution 2121 approves a tree removal plan for the Ignite site um, that was prepared by Civil Design Advantage. And it also, the resolution has language that directs our parks department to relocate trees that are of desirable um, size and, and health from that poly ice site to public parks and, and other public properties in the city of Johnston. Um, if you would like in that staff report, um, there's a site plan that, that indicates the areas where trees will be removed. Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Else have any questions? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-21? So moved, Evans. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy Bolt, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Soroka? Yes. Hope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion passed. Item 8F, consider approval of claims in the amount of $1,208,534.44. Do we have a motion to approve? Move, Evans. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy vote, please. Councilmember Reddy? Yes. Roca? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to city administrator staff comments. I just got a couple items I wanted to mention tonight. Um, first of all, at our next council meeting, which would be February 1st, <clears throat> we have one other item that we need to continue for our um, strategic plan, and that will be talk about the master staffing plan. We didn't quite get to that with our strategic planning session that we had earlier in the month. And so the, the intent is to, to finish up that part of the plan so that we can get the final plan approved. Um, with that, I just wanted to recognize that we did have our, um, our second strategic planning session on January 5th and it went really well, had some great feedback and and looking forward to getting the final report once uh, once we finish that master staffing plan. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that we also had the broadband meeting on, on January 13th. And all in all, I think we had some excellent discussion and uh, good questions from our citizens at the meeting. And I appreciate everything that uh, uh, Adam and David Woolworthing and, and um, others have done in, in uh, working on that broadband plan and uh, so we, we again got some great feedback for continuing with that project. And then the final thing I wanted to say is that I believe the end of this week and first part of next week, Polk County Emergency Management is having their annual uh, review of the, um, the emergency management program. And it's a great opportunity for the council to see and, and uh, understand what Polk County Emergency Management does for Johnson and other communities in the metro area. So I sent an email a week or so ago with the three times that they're gonna provide. It is gonna be held via um, Zoom. So um, it'd take about an hour of your time if you have the time to, to uh, attend that session. So if you uh, hadn't signed up for it and would like the information, uh, please let me know and I can resend that to you. But it, it's a great opportunity to to see what, um, uh, how Polk County Emergency Management works for our community. And that's all I have for this evening. Okay. Any other staff comments, Jim? Anybody else have any comments this, after this evening? Okay, I think we're good, thank you. Okay, City Council comments. Councilman Evan. Nothing, thank you. Councilmember Martin. I would just uh, restate that the Polk County uh, Emergency Services, um, I listen in to their weekly updates on COVID and vaccination, et cetera, and they're excellent. Um, 
and it's the best money we could spend, actually, I think. And that's all my comment. Okay. Councilman Soroika. Um, just that uh, I think I'm scheduled for the 5.30 session on Thursday with Polk County Emergency Management. So if anyone else is there, it'll be a party. See you there. <laughs> um, and otherwise, um, no comments. Thank you. Councilman uh, Reddy. Uh, uh, no comments today. Councilman Cole. I'll pass. Thank you. And I will pass as well. We do have one more agenda item this evening, and that is a closed session. Cindy, if you could scroll up. Sorry. Closed session per Iowa Code Section 21.51C per Iowa Code Section, I just said that, 21.51C. We discuss strategy with council on matters that are presently in litigation or where litigation is eminent, where its disclosure would be likely to prejudice or disadvantage the position of the governmental body in that litiga litigation. Do we have a motion to go into closed session? So moved, Evans. Second, Cope. We have a motion and a second. Cindy, vote, please. Councilmember Soroka? Yes. Cope? Yes. Evans? Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. Cindy sent out another email with the uh, link, so we will um, we will close down here and move on to the uh, to closed section. Cindy, sorry, Cindy, I don't, don't think I received that email. Can you forward that for the closed session, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all, all in a minute.